It's good to see a room filled with lifelong learners. Uh, I'm Joanne Bundy, and I, uh, the planning committee joins me in welcoming you all to the bucket courses. Everything you want to learn before you take the bucket. Uh, our class this morning is the second class of a four-class course on grief and loss. So if you will silence your cell phones, turn on your tea coil, we're ready to turn it over to Dr. Paulson to talk, uh, teach us our class. I have received so many comments from those of you here in the class and also people who watch on our YouTube site about how helpful this class is, has, was last, just last week. So we hope to continue that and I'm delighted to introduce again uh, the uh, primary care physician at a Grinnell Family Care, Dr. J.R. Paulson. Thanks again. Let's do a little sound test in the back. How are we back there? Will we be okay? Yeah. All right. Uh, the weather's a little warmer, so we have less uh, to complain about with the weather. Next week should even be better yet. So I don't know if we need a better turnout. Well, let's get going. A good grief. <clears throat> Part two. This is where we left off before. We'll talk about your homework assignments uh, after break. Mm -hmm. Others are ill prepared to help us deal with loss. They don't know what to say. They're afraid of our feelings. They try to change the subject. They intellectualize. They think that keeping busy helps. They don't want to talk about death. They want us to keep our faith. They often repeat just what they have heard or been told. You can't fall apart. Get a hold of yourself. Keep a stiff upper lip. Pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Be strong for the children. Time heals all wounds, etc., etc. What are some, uh, what I would say, non helpful examples that you've heard? Anybody? That we come up with a list. It's a blessing. It's a blessing. <laughs> They're in a better place. Yes. God needed another You'll angel. Get over God it. needed another angel. Yes. You'll get over it. Could be worse. Could be worse. Oh, the Scandinavian person. <laughs> Could be worse. Yeah, we've heard that before. Here's the killer us. Made some good jokes on that. But again, does that help us very much? Not usually. It may actually cause the opposite reaction. Well, what about I know just how you feel? Oh, I know just how you feel. You don't. We all have to go through this. How about this one? Ah, it turns a tragic loss into a lame attempt at helping others to cope. There's Bob up there, what I'm doing. Just get over it. Just get over it. That's what I did. Is that philosophy out there? Have you ever heard that? Oh, yeah. Right? Took it from us males. They are afraid of our feelings and, of course, their own. This is people trying to help. Very early on, society teaches us that feelings and the displaying of them are somehow not appropriate. Big boys and girls don't cry. Stop crying, or I'll give you a reason to cry. <laughs> Have your parents ever said that to you? <laughs> Whoa. Um, what is heard on the playground when you're little kids? I remember it. Cry, baby, cry, baby. Remember that? So it's already very, very early in our elementary years. Whatever the reason for the hurt or the loss, baby, baby, baby. Nobody goes over and goes, oh, you know, the sympathy type stuff. So we learned this pretty easy. Um, especially true for men. We send very different messages to boys and girls. 
If you don't believe this, I'm going to try to convince you of that. Starts very early and continues throughout home training, and then is reinforced in school. At age two, girls are interrupted when they're speaking more than boys. In kindergarten, boys get more attention than girls. As early as first grade, teachers call on boys more than girls and allow them to speak more in class. Elementary school teachers praise girls for how they dress and wear their hair, whereas boys are coached and praised for how they solve problems and accomplish tasks. Boys are asked more thought-provoking questions, suggesting that teachers believe boys are more capable of abstract thinking than our girls. From preschool through high school, boys receive more of teachers' attention and are given more time to talk. That's based on data. Both mothers and fathers encourage boys' gross motor activities more than girls. Boys are allowed more freedom from adult supervision. Girls receive more encouragement to show dependency and tender emotions. As early as three to six months, mothers smile more at their daughters than at their sons. At school and daycare, staff also smile more at girls than at boys. Communications are very different to boys and girls. Fathers give their sons more commands and demands, like saying, bring me the book. The girls are likely to say, could you please bring me that book? <laughs> Not only do parents talk more politely to girls, but by 18 months of age, they include a greater variety of words conveying emotion, both positive, such as happiness and pride, and negative, primarily sadness and fear, than they do in conversation with their sons. When parents do talk to their sons about feelings, it's mostly about anger. Women guiding their child, oh, when guiding their child through conflict, mothers favor establishing harmony with their daughters, but accept retaliation as a solution by their sons. Both parents punish children differently. While boys are more likely to be punished for hitting their brother or sister or for grabbing toys, parents are more likely to explain to girls why they shouldn't do those things. The bottom line is, we concentrate on feelings with our daughters and actions with our sons. So, something to, to ponder. Uh, I think, Sue. How come... The sisters, later on, if I say, you always liked Chris better. <laughs> They've got your guilt hot point. <clears throat> they They're very smart. Yeah. <laughs> the question is, what about girls later? Girls will say, you always liked the boy better than me. Mm -hmm. They've learned your guilt point and what gets you going. So now you have to compensate with, no I didn't, no I didn't, well, I'll give you this or that. <laughs> so girls may be more intellectual, smarter, at least on that. <laughs> As men, then, is it any wonder that we don't do very well expressing our feelings? If my son told his friends how he feels, they think he was a sissy. Imagine your junior high boy going to talk to, or the high school kid about his feelings, how he feels. The macho man is best typified by the male role models in the old movies, especially the westerns. Remember those? Yeah. Yeah, that's what we grew up with, a lot of us. I put paint dyes as an example. Uh, it was a, I didn't, can't remember which series it was, but paint was the horse of the famous cowboy. And, and paint goes along and breaks his leg. Well, you know what you'd have to do with a horse when it breaks its leg. So it comes over, pulls out his... Okay. Yeah. Put it in. Just goes on. Like nothing happens. This is his horse he's had for maybe five, six, seven years. Think there's a bond between him? Does he be whoa, macho man? Just, this is what's got to be done. Don't have any emotions about that. I was after seeing Unbroken, and and all the men can do all kinds of things, and I think. Is it because they can't show their feelings? 
The question is, she had seen the movie Unbroken, and I'm going to delve into that quite a bit in the next uh, class. Uh, story of war, survival, true story, movie, uh, Zeph Greening, right? And uh, yeah, we're going to use that a lot. So we'll be back to that. So my command, in love as the pop song, and I can't remember, somebody help me out. What's the song? Before you don't cry, remember that? I grew up to that, radio. I'm just going out, the road, big boys don't cry at all. Oh, who was it? Anybody know? Girls don't cry. There's a lot. Girls don't cry. There's also one on boys too, though. But I remember, or I heard, there is one about boys don't cry. But big girls don't cry also. So several songs saying, "Don't be quiet." When faced with a loss, any loss, we're told over and over, "Take on your man." You heard that? Shedding tears is generally seen as a sign of weakness in a man, but accepted and almost expected in a girl or a woman. They try to change the subject. So, another thing that people do is they try to change the subject. Can you remember trying to tell someone how you were feeling, recalling how the listener wanted to look interested, but as soon as possible, change the subject? trying to tell them how I'm feeling and they go, yeah, I like being rested and all of a sudden they change. Hi, are you okay? It's just real hard. Oh, everything's going to be okay. Hey, there's Joe over there. When's the funeral? <laughs> Is this a normal way we do? When we see people doing stuff? Get away from those feelings. Get into something else. Change the subject. Both males and females. Rarely do we hear, could you tell me more about how you're feeling? More about your sadness? I can't imagine how painful it's me. Not, oh, I know how you're feeling. I can't imagine. What was your relationship like? Or is that going to take a totally different direction? Or... I'm so sorry. Pregnant pause often is the right thing to say. Nothing. Don't put foot in mouth. Yeah. Seriously, it's the hardest thing for physicians to do. And they time this in offices. When people start crying or doing something, how long before the doctor has to fill in that void? And it ain't very long. They get pretty dang nervous. They just, they just cannot just let that emotion out. We got to get on with something. But often, silence is golden. Physical contact. You don't have to say anything. Put your arm in the shoulder. Give them a hug. Take their hand. We think you got to yak something. The example I like to use, or would use, for people is they say, oh, I don't know what to say. So, pretend you were in another country, be in Africa, where the tribe only speaks Swahili, be in Chinese, where they speak some kind of Mandarin, and you're there, and you witness some horrendous loss. Maybe a child dies, or a man dies, or somebody gets hit by a car. You're, you're not an oldest person, you don't know anything about their culture. What are you going to say to this grieving mother? You're not going to say anything, are you? Because you don't have any language to say. But I posit that that, you know what to do if you go inside. That is a human experience of loss. We all know what to do. You show it with your body language. What you do. You don't just, I don't know, try to walk away or pretend you didn't see it. You can have some tears in your eyes, you can go over, you can put your arm around, you can just sit there. You don't have to say anything. And can, can you convey, convey support to that person? You better believe it. So language, the nonverbal, is, is the, the thing, I think. Barbara Walters, she was doing a TV uh, 
session on loss of pets. They're talking about what it's like to lose a pet that you've been very attached to for a long time. And near the end of the latter part of the show, she's, this is a sad story about the pet. And she's starting to get emotional about it. So she says, before I cry, let's change the subject. Let's go to a commercial break. <laughs> and, you know, looks over at the guy, commercial. Then she comes back and she's all composed and makeup's fine and everything. Well, tell me more, you know. So, what's the subtext? Let's deal with our feelings by changing the subject. Is it, boy, that story really gets me. I'm going to cry. That's okay. No, not on TV. They intellectualize. <clears throat> Third point. The vast majority of verbal and nonverbal communication agreement will hear appeals to the intellect and not to the expression of feelings. This is not surprising since many people try to deal with their pain by using their intellect. In studies, so this data, over 80% of comments heard by grievers shortly after a death were appeals to the intellect, often in the form of advice. Not usually helpful. Those that were felt helpful to the griever talked about feelings. One of your subtext questions was, why do I say whatever? So I'll give you some examples. Be thankful you have another son. Living must go on. She led a full life. This time has come. It's had come. Be thankful you can have more children. You lived a long life. God never gives you more than you can handle. You'll find someone else. You can always buy another dog. You just couldn't beat the cancer. It was just meant to be. Now, I posit these statements are probably all true. Yes, if you've lost a child or a miscarriage, you can't have another kid. I mean, the, if you go back and look at those, just from a non-emotional thing, a lot of those are true. But the griever is experiencing intense emotional pain, which has very little to do with his intellect. Probably isn't functioning very well at the moment anyways. So those comments are going to go here or be totally useless. Example, cancer news. So as a doctor, unfortunately, I have the, the experience of having to have, sometimes tell people that they have cancer. And I also watch how other doctors that, uh, have done that and do that in their training. Uh, so a case might go like this. Uh, Mr. Stolz, we have your uh, CAT scan and X-ray results here, and the biopsy results in their back. And you have the stage uh, four colon cancer. Uh, now uh, we have four or five different uh, regimens for chemotherapy. We're going to do one is five FU, and uh, I think we should do CBC and stage and CAT scan, and uh, like we're going to start that that therapy. And they go, blah, 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 blah. where is the brain of that patient? <laughs> Are they intellectualizing any of this? I posit not. Because I certainly wouldn't. When they hear that cancer, that it's turned, you're tuned off. You're tuned out. It's gone to the limbic system in my model. It's down, well, limbic system in your brain, your heart. You're thinking, God, how long do I have? What about my kids? What about my wife? Blah, blah, all these things. Listen to the stupid thing the doctor's talking about or what's going to happen, but we go on and give them all this information and wonder why they came in later. They didn't hear any of it. Well, we told them all this stuff. Well, where were they at? It's an emotional loss. It, as soon as you get that, they're at an emotional level, not an intellectual. They think that keeping busy helps. Ever heard that one? Tell people? We're taught and hear this from early age as a way to deal with loss. The idea is if we just keep active, we'll somehow begin to feel better. If luckily it does work, it works for about five minutes. So you're back doing whatever you're doing, but where's your brain? Well, back to the loss, isn't it? You don't stay distracted. The suggestion helps us to avoid the real issues often also, which actually makes the pain last longer. 
the Academy Award recovery. Since we are given so many strong clues not to show our emotions, and we hear many rationalizations, it's not surprising that we act recovered. The griever often feels he or she is being constantly judged, evaluated, advised. Do this, don't do that, you won't try to do this, won't try to do that. So, we all like praise, we all like approval, and compliments, don't we? I do. So, measure this, remember, when 80% of all the comments we hear tell us to behave in a certain way, what do you think what happens? We do. If we act okay, we don't upset others. Which remember, we're taught also not to do. Don't upset other people. They don't want to see our grief. They don't want to see our emotions. That'll upset them. So we act that way. Soon we actually believe it ourselves. How are you doing? Uh, your husband died a month and a half ago. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. I'm doing or I'm doing okay. You may not say fine. Okay. <coughs> big lie, big crack. But what happens if you say, no, I'm doing horrible. I'm really having a tough time. We don't say that because what happens then? We get all this negative stuff or we make the other person feel bad. Only alone at home, hidden from maybe our family or our friends, can we cry and show the enormous pain that we feel. Because we're not going to be judged. We're not gonna, nobody's going to be there to have to worry about. Page 41, Frank. Okay? Remember uh, I talked about Frank where his dog died, his bike got stolen, he broke up with his girlfriend. Well, his life goes on. So later on Frank's line, which we'll talk about his lost history, his father died. So when Frank's father died, a friend called and asked him, how are you doing? Are you doing okay? Frank said, I'm sad. I feel real sad. His friend responded by saying, you shouldn't feel sad. You should be grateful. He accomplished so much during his life. It was just time to let him go. Now, two ways you can look at that. On the intellectual level, he was right. He had a great life. He accomplished lots of things. So everything he said was correct on this level. But it doesn't make the loss any easier. In fact, what he wanted to do was scream at his friend. <laughs> there was a lot more his father wanted to do in life, but just hadn't done it. And he's dead, damn it. <laughs> That's what he wanted to say to the friend. Later in John's life, he got married, and uh, they had a baby, but their infant son died. Another unloved loss. Torn apart. But what he heard were things like, you and your wife should be grateful that you can have other children. It was just not meant to be. You're strong enough to handle it. Now, on an intellectual basis, they're all true. But this didn't help John any, right? Deal with his feelings. So, because wanting the approval of others, he started to go into the I'm okay. And as we talk later about miscarriage, that men are usually the unseen uh, people that have lots of trouble after. Uh, the loss of a baby. Everyone puts all their attention on the mother, and the men are sometimes forgotten. Well, part three then, what is normal grief? How do we define it? How long does the mourning last? Is there a pattern in normal grief? Are there stages of grief? How do we know when we or someone else is through it? What are the signs and symptoms of grief? When does grief become abnormal or pathologic? Good questions. And a lot of those questions I got from you, because those are some of the ones that you ask at the start of class. For better or worse, and in this case worse, normal grief, I would uh, posit, or any behavior, is defined by our society. 
Most in the healing professions have traditionally understood mourning as a normal process. However, since we've become more urban and more modern, mourning has taken on more of the stigma of a disease. Something to be treated and minimized as much as possible in our fast-paced world. Grieving is different now than it was 100 years ago. Very, very different. Because our society is very different. Yes? I think there's something to be said for wearing black for a year and not participating. She said, there's something to be said for wearing black for a year and not participating in the things. Yep. And we're going to, one of the things is, we're going to talk about later, is other ways or rituals that we have that can help us do this. So that's in my next thing. Yes. I think when I see a man cry, I think of him as stronger because he's going against <coughs> normal a, a concept of men don't cry. I think he's strong. How many of you would agree with that? If you see a man and he's crying, do you feel he's stronger or weaker? How many think he's stronger? Raise your hand. How many think he's weaker? Pretty unanimous. But what does our society, you know, try to do? And if, does he get beat down by other men? You know, if you see some guy in the locker room and he's crying or something, do you think the other guy's going to let that go? Probably not. Crying ruined a political career, and I can't call his name right now. Who was the guy from Maine who cried? So the question is, whose political yeah. career was uh, almost ruined by showing emotion and crying? Ed Muskie was the answer. Ed Muskie, yeah. So let's, we'll come back to some more politics. Jim? One of the differences I would think in the world today is that families are dispersed geographically and in the older world, or whatever you want to call it in your example, families were concentric geographically more, and so your grieving with family members is different, I think, than grieving with public or friends. Uh, Jim, stating that in the old days, wherever that is, that's a moving target for some of us. Uh, but in a generation or two before, where the family was more nuclear around, you had all of the relatives there, you saw each other, you shared things. But now, somebody flies in from California, somebody comes in from Connecticut, you're, you're there for a few minutes, you got to do all this stuff, and then boom, they're off and gone again. So you got in that support. And again, in the times before we said, the funeral was in, often in the parlor in the in the house. So as kids, this was part of the normal. You saw this and you dealt with it. So I agree, that's one of the strong factors why things are very different. Do we have any objective data or studies about the reason morning? Anybody study this stuff? Unfortunately, not much. We didn't talk about sex politics and grief. <laughs> So oh, let's we will digress a little bit. The sex. To keep your interest in case some of you were not involved. <laughs> so the question is, what's normal sexual behavior? Well, pre when I was born in 47, it was what? Society nobody knew what normal behavior was. Society kind of told you what was normal behavior, because if you did something and society went, ooh, don't do that, or your mother slapped you, or said, we don't do that uh, with herself, or whatever she said, then, I mean, you got the message. But nobody knew what was normal. So, Ken would like to know that this was an entomologist at Indiana University, a wasp, in, in, I call him a wasp specialist. I would say he's a hymenopterist or whatever. But anyways, yeah, he got bored with wasps inside. He wanted to study sexual question and thing. So he came up with this study, 1948, of, with Pomeroy. They surveyed hundreds and hundreds of men to find out all these sexual questions. What do they do? What do they do when they don't die in public? Why, well, you know, and, and get all that, and let's publish that. 1948. How do they behave? 
I mean, you know, if you want to define normal, you need to know what people are doing. And then, in 53, you women got to crack at this. <laughs> so, what's normal for your women? What do you do when other people don't, uh, aren't around? Written all by Written males. Written by males. <laughs> Written by males. <laughs> That's of course. It was the 50s, you know. And, but it was still literally eye-popping <laughs> when it came out. So you find other people are doing that? Or do, or all of these things that came out, we could have a whole series on that, but let's move on. Later then, uh, so now we know what people are doing. So it's tough to say normal. If 80% are doing something, to call that abnormal because everybody's kind of doing that. So that's Bill Johnson and, uh, no, uh, Johnson and Bill Masters. And they uh, ended up, she divorced her husband and married him, and they in St. Louis set up an institute to study the actual sexual in the laboratory. Not asking questions, but let's find out what people are really doing. So published in 1966, they had 382 women, 312 men, and she was involved with this, so... She was writing about it. They studied over 10,000 sexual acts. Recorded had electrodes inside people. Video, I mean, you know, say, well, how can they get good data from that? Well, it was a lab setup, and people criticized some of the thing. But they found out there are stages that people go through in sex. We just, we just have sex. And they, you know, oh, there's four distinct stages. There's this stage, and this stage, and this stage, and this stage. And that's the way it is in a male. And there's this stage, and this stage, and this stage, and this stage, and that's the way it is in a female. So we are really all pretty much the same. And I don't care who you are or what you're doing. So they talked about, and came up with data of what's normal. So some people would come in and say, well, doctor, I have this, and is that abnormal? And then people would say, no, that's, that's normal. But we didn't have anything to define that. Now, they also were asked, and did for about eight or nine years, try to convert homosexuals. It was part of their clinic in St. Louis. They, they tried to convert, and they claimed a 70% conversion rate. She, when she divorced him, said one of the things, she thought he was falsifying the data. They weren't doing that well. And who they, yeah. But that was before this, 73. The American Psychiatric Association says homosexuality now is not a mental disorder. It is not an illness. Now, other parts of our society or religious or other societal things that I'm going to buy this, yeah, but when the American Psychiatric Society, so who gives them the right? It, based on society, we've come further at this point. So LG lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual stuff now that you, you see all the time. Boy, that was going to happen before here. Very, very different. So now it's not a mental disorder. And I went down and spent some time in my training with Masters and Johnson. I got scholarships to go down there. So it was kind of interesting, to say the least. <laughs> now, what about grief and mourning? How long should it last? After the Vietnam War, a scientific poll was taken of residents in the Midwest regarding grief. The question was, how long is it normal to mourn the loss of a loved one? So it's just like going back to the sex. You know, how often do you have sex? How often? Well, let's do the survey. What do you think the answer was? And some of you know the answer, but if you know the answer, don't say it. But throw some guesses up. Forever. Forever? No, never. Never? A year. Give me some more answers, please. Um, six months. Six months. <laughs> Three days. Three days. Think of all. I'm glad the price is right, right? <laughs> Come on, tell the rest of you. A year. A year. Two years. Two years. Well, I think it would be different for each person. It depends on which one. The answer thought it would be different for each person. But then you still have to survey in front of you and say, no, we don't want to know each person. What do you think is the average grief time? Normal, yes? I think it would depend on exactly what you're mourning and how they died. Depends on what you're mourning and how they died. 
In this right, case, but still, what are you going to? How many? What are you going to put on the on the survey sure. if they ask you? I have a question on the yes. Vietnam War part. Are you? Are you? It isn't the, just about Vietnam people coming back. I, I'm just trying not, to say. A lot of these guys were coming back, and there was a lot of grief going on. Either loss that they had had, their buddies had had, probably post-traumatic sorrow, all that stuff. And they said, let's just see where people, how long does it take you to get over it? So you come back, or one of your buddies was killed, how long should it be? Again. How do you define get over it? Well, I'm just going to say, let's move on, but I want you to see how long is it normal to mourn the loss of a loved one? I mean, you know, you got to do that. But, answer, the overwhelming majority thought individuals should be through mourning between 48 hours, what? yes, and two weeks after death. That's what the population said. Oh, I'm just telling you, this is, you live in the Midwest, so, I mean, these are, I'll give you the data, let's move on. Now, the results of this poll have been replicated a number of times with approximately the same results. So this is not one out in the weeds survey. They ask other people, United States, different places, and they find there's a little variation in age. So whether you're 18, 24, or 79, there's no difference. Like, well, older people, they, they realize it hurts more and lasts longer. Doesn't make any difference. Gender, oh, women are more emotional, more tender-hearted, they're going to takes longer. No, no difference. Region of the country. They're in the Bible Belt, or they're in the South, or they're in California. No difference. Educational level, college graduates, they're going to be more up here versus somebody that dropped out of high school. Uh, nope. In addition, many physicians and nurses feel that this time should be short also. They become a little concerned if symptoms become more than a month. So if somebody comes in and they're kind of grieving after a month, and then you know, we're kind of, well, maybe something's going on and it should be gone. So even your professionals are very skewed to, well, this, you know, should be getting on with this. So that's the backdrop that we have to deal with. Is grief a disease with a medical imperative to treat symptoms? In 1980, a study of physicians in Illinois 87% assumed that a standard of care that called for prescribing either a barbiturate or tranquilizer for mourners at the time of the loss. So doctors at that time in Illinois said that, yeah, we should be giving people barbiturates, sleeping pills, tranquilizers, whoever, for that's the standard of care. 83% still felt that it should be the standard of care after a week, not just to help you sleep tonight and get through the funeral. You know, but, but later. And 70% still felt it would be appropriate six months after the loss of a loved one. If they're still having symptoms. Oh, is grief a disease? What does the general public think? 89% of the general public poll in 1980 understood mourning was an illness that needed to be suppressed either by the use of medicine or alcohol or through sheer determination or the exercise of faith. Most of those fall thought it was appropriate for doctors to prescribe drugs as a means of suppressing the symptoms. Now, what does our society say? We go, one more minute, and we're going to have a break. I call up, or I have my nurse call up. How much do employers think you should have to grieve? We're now college. Five days of pay, bereavement leave for an immediate family member. There's a little disclaimer at the bottom that I thought was interesting. I don't know if George has seen this or not. It says, Oh, if we can find somebody to cover you. Yes. Oh. You know, oh, wait a minute, what's that thing at the bottom? If we can get somebody to cover you, you know, and your dad died, or your son died, or your husband died, we'll, we'll, we'll give you time off. We can't find anybody, so I don't know what's going to happen or with that. Cornell Newburgh Schools, three days for, this is a close family member. Cornell uh, Mutual Reinsurance, the honor system, wow, I was taken back on that one. Grand Regional Medical Center, they have PTO time, personal time off, so you have this bank of time, you can use it for mental health day, you can use it for sickness, you can use it for you want. So the number of days you got in there, you can take it off. But I love the last one, Jeldwin. Family member, the day of the funeral. Oh my. Well, we expect you back here, I mean, if you want pay, the next day. 
uh, you don't have to be back here. We can go and pay. So grieve and get your mind in the game. And, but our whole thing is get back to work and get busy. I mean, but this is how our society. You see how. Yes, I just called that two days ago. Yep. Okay, so we're going to take a break, and then after break, we're going to talk about some more uh, little research that was done by this lady, who is very, oh, I gave you this number at the bottom, was the Poodle Ross. So we're going to talk a little bit about her after break. Enjoy your uh, break. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed it, but when JR was talking about sex, you could hear a pin drop in this room. <laughs> you know, everybody had their way of, of breathing. Uh, my dad's first wife died, and he had a very difficult and long time getting over that. And so when he heard that one of his friends had lost his wife, Dad went to see him, uh, hoping that he could share some of the emotions that he had gone through. And when he talked to him and said a lot of appropriate things, and the man replied to him, Well, Louis, when you've been married to the same wife for 35 years, that's a long time. Oh. <laughs> 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 and so here we are, back to jail. Uh, Carol mentioned uh, about the boy and girl difference going way back, which is a wonderful point, which both of us that were babies know. The first thing that I think the question that comes out when the baby pops out is, is it okay or how's it doing, is what? Is it a boy or a girl? That's all they care about. So I'm covering this up, and, you know, everybody's got to do that. And as Carol said, that's to give us the clue on how to treat this that's right. The baby. We want to treat the girl baby. We want to talk to her different. The intonation in her voice. If it's a boy baby, we're going to handle it different in the nursery uh, at the exact time of birth. Correct. So that is very poignant. And I'll bring up personal things. I treat my cats differently. I'm conditioned. I'm in the same society as the rest of you. And uh, I got a girl cat, Susie. And I talk to her a little differently. Linda will agree with this. Now my boy cats, like your quiet. I, I rough house more with them, and I more cuddly sweeties with Susie, and they're all it cats. Yeah, so where is this? It's, it's, they're all it. You know, it's, they've got you know a hormone. So it's, but I treat them differently, and they're just cats. So you can see the the, the conditioning is no going on. They're not complaining. Okay, let's talk about Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Uh, she's a remarkable woman. She was born in Zurich, Switzerland in uh, 26. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about her life more because it's very interesting, her experience with grief and loss. And she's one of triplets in Protestant religion. And uh, her, I'll come up, I'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, in a second. And, of course, in 1969, she published this poem classic on, on death and dying. What the dying have to teach doctors, nurses, clergy, and their own families. This was a seminal. I was fortunate 10 years later to have her come to my medical school and have a lecture and sit down and talk with her and different things. Later, published two years after, or a year after she died, she did a collaboration with David Kessler, who I went to a uh, class with him uh, just last fall, on grief, on grief and grieving at the dying. She expanded that. And in this, she talks about her grief line. Um, so, let me see if I want to go there. Now, let me go back and just tell about her a little bit, and then we're going to get back to her a little bit further on. Um, her dad didn't want her to be a doctor because girls weren't doctors. Finally gave up, and um, she got accepted with medical school. And she was all excited because she wanted to be a pediatrician. 
but she got pregnant. <clears throat> and you cannot be pregnant and get into pediatric residency. Uh, if you're pregnant, the only residency you can do is psychiatry. <laughs> so psychiatry residency. She came back, married a, a, a man that she met with a physician in the United States, came back here to the University of Chicago. Um, and that's where she did a lot of her work for, got the information for the book. We'll come back to her in a little bit. So what are four things you wish someone had told me about grief? That's what this class is about. I want to try to come up with more than four. It's grief a disease. I put a little star by it and wake you up and go, oh yeah, that's an important point. <laughs> so if you remember that, I'll feel successful. Grief is a normal and a necessary process for all losses. That's my I don't care what other people say, that's <laughs> what I say. Grief is not a disorder, a disease, or a sign of weakness. It's an emotional, physical, and spiritual necessity. Not optional. It's all of the above. And it's the price you pay for love. So if you're not going to love, you're not going to grieve. The more you're going to love, the more you're going to grieve. You just, that's the way it works. The only cure for grief is to grieve. You're not going to get around it which people will try to do. And again, Queen Elizabeth II said this. Pretty memorable. It's a price you pay for love. Now, what do physicians think today? We have our own Bible. This is the Bible, Diagnostic uh, Statistical Manual, number five, just came out last year. It was four before, now it's five. That tells us, you know, if you're depressed, if you're manic depressive, if you're personality disorder gives us the criteria for us to say, oh, you were in this box, or in this box, you're pigeonholed. So grief hasn't been mentioned much in there before. And this, I thought, was remarkable because it just happened this year. And I want to read this to you. Respondents, responses to a significant loss, that is bereavement, financial ruin, that's interesting, losses from natural disaster, or a series of medical illnesses, you have cancer, heart failure, stroke, or disability, may include the feeling of intense sadness, rumination about the loss, insomnia, poor appetite, and weight loss, noted in criteria A. Those are markers for depression, all of those things, which may resemble a depressive episode. Although such symptoms may be understandable or considered appropriate to the laws, the presence of a major depressive episode in addition to the normal response to a significant loss should also be carefully considered. So they're saying, yes, it's normal to have all these emotions, but there may be some depression also. This decision inevitably requires the exercise of clinical judgment based on the individual's history and, I love this, the cultural norms for the expression of distress in the context of loss. In the next class, that's what we're going to talk about. What's the, the contextual cultural norms in trying to decide what's normal or what's abnormal. In other words, all grief is individual. So that's your next star All grief is individual. Oh, we all have grief, we all go through that, yes, but everyone is individual. So how long does normal grief last? Third pearl. I say, as long as it takes. I mean, that's my answer. I get sports injuries, guys go, my ankle going to be better. Well, as long as it takes. They don't like that. And I say, well, when you can do these criteria, these criteria, do this and do this, then I'm going to declare you well and cured and go back and play. And so you can do these things, and your sprained ankle may take two days, may take two, two weeks, it might be a high sprain and take two months. But you got to go through it. And I don't have a crystal ball. The only people who think there's a time limit for grief have never lost a piece of their heart. 
How we think or want grief to be. We want it to be, here's the grief starts, there are the grief ends. So my next drawing is how I think it is. <laughs> I think it's more like that. It's up, it's down, it's backwards, it's all over the place. Are there patterns, phases, or well-recognized stages of grief? Yeah. And no. <laughs> the next three slides, or four slides I'm going to show you, are some data done on 1,200 grievers recently within the last uh, few decades. And they would have symptom complex and then ask 100 people and follow them. That's, a lot of, that's pretty good data. How intense their symptoms were. And so the phase is, and this is in the first two weeks after the death of a loved one. So shock and numbness is their first stage. Resistance to stimuli. Judgment, difficult. You can't make decisions. Functioning is impeded. Emotional outbursts. Anger crying. Stunned feelings. Two weeks, look where they are, the intensity, real high. But what happens? Does it just go like this? I don't think so. Remember, if, we, if they did what people said, two weeks, right? You should be, oh, I have all this, and then bam, you're fine. But look at how far they go up. Oh, gee, four, six, 12 months. Notice there's a peak right at 12 months. Why is there a peak right at 12 months? <laughs> Duh. The anniversary re brings a lot of this stuff back, right? And then look how far they plotted. I don't know what happened to people after 24 months, but that's pretty impressive, isn't it? Intensity of the characteristics of mourning in the first four months after the death of a loved one. They call this, in their study, searching and yearning. You're very sensitive to stimuli. You may have anger and guilt, restlessness, impatient, ambiguous, testing what is real. High, little different pattern. Comes down, what happens at 12 months? Boom! And then kind of comes down. The characteristics of mourning from the fifth to the ninth month. We're not talking weeks here. And the, this uh, measures disorientation, disorganized, maybe depression, guilt, weight gain, or loss. As people compensate, eat less or more. That's a coping medicine. Or does rally. Notice this kind of goes up. These symptoms. And there's a little spike at 12 anniversary, but not as much. So these symptoms get worse. They start right away, they're horrible, and then they gradually build. And then, look, at up to a couple of years already. Why does it drop so rapidly, immediately, in the first week? Um, why does it drop, the question is, why does it drop so rapidly in the first week? Um, if you've been through a major loss, people, you just try to talk to them and ask them, well, what do you got to do this or that? Their brain just isn't working. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just, it's in, in a fog. I mean, you can ask them what's a combination to your locker or who's feeding the cats and what, or, or what's coming up next week. You're, you're just in this, the brain in and out or in, this, in that shock phase. We're going to talk about what sometimes is called denial, but not necessarily. But anyway, in that shock phase, it's just like it. And then all of a sudden your brain, you know, you get usually off so the funeral's over too. And now you start, oh, I got all this to do, and what do I got to do? But you can't think about what do I got to do in that immediate time. You're just so overwhelmed. Most people, you know, for a loved one. But good question. What does recovery look like? How do you know when you do it? This can be called reorganization, resolution, reintegration, recovery, a lot of R words. Acceptance, peace, or simply healing. I said not heal because I don't believe you're ever healed. Yeah. I believe there's always a scar, forever. Uh, because the process never ends. Characteristics of reorientation. 
which dominate near the end of the second year after the death of a loved one. So now, in reorganizing, you have a sense of release, you have a little more energy, you're making better judgments, you're eating normal now, you're sleeping better. It's real crappy, six months, gets a little better, and then this is reorganization. You're getting better, so this curve goes up because, see, these are positive things that are happening to you. So you see, this is not some simple line, is it? You see why I did the curly Q type thing. So if you think it's going to be a straight shot, it's not going to happen. Now, people have different ways that they look at it, uh, stages of grief, uh, loss, shock, denial, emotional outburst, anger, fear, searching. You get down in the pits, loneliness, guilt, isolation, depression. <coughs> then you start getting, coming up, little new relationships, new strength, new patterns, hope, affirmation. And eventually, we'll talk about this later, helping others. That's a good sign that you're really you're better. I like this representation of grief. The whirlpool of grief. River of life. Oh, you want to offer a waterfall. Waterfall is the death. And now you're in this whirlpool. Loss, emotional disorganization, falling apart. Severe disorganization, all washed up, breakdown, on the rocks, pain and physical symptoms. Then the river calms out the mourning and acceptance of reality and then reorganization and loving again. Some people shh, get stuck in the whirlpool. Remember, bereavement is what happens to you. Grief is what you feel. And mourning is what you do. We talked about that earlier. Let's keep those definitions straight. I like this, the grief wheel. And uh, so you start shock, numbness, denial, outburst, weight loss, protest, and pre-shock, preoccupation with thoughts of the deceased, anger, or excuse me, anger, yearning, disorganization, decreased socialization, you don't go out, you withdraw, you have apathy, aimlessness, withdrawal. Then you start to reorganize, finding the meaning in life and death, trying new patterns of behavior. And if you do well, you come up into recovery. But you could keep going around, or you could take this path in deterioration. I'm going to talk about that more next time. What people do, um, what people go what way, and what people go the other way, and why do they do that way, and how can we help people change their trajectory or pattern. Well, let's talk about Ross again. Again, she's in the Swiss family, she languages, returned to Switzerland. Marriage back to Chicago. So in 1965, she was asked by four students in Chicago's Theologic Seminary to help conduct a research project on the dying. She had easy access to a population of dying patients for interviews, but other physicians at the hospital were uncomfortable with her approach. She soon found uh, locating a suitable interviewees was difficult, but she was a pretty feisty lady. And so she prevailed, and by 67, she was interviewing dying patients behind one-way mirrors, followed by a roundtable discussion with students and attending physicians after the patient had left. So she's actually, the other doctor said, don't be doing this. This is inappropriate. It's actually immoral or bad to be doing this. So she came out with most of you have heard of the five stages of grief. Denial, can't be happy. Anger, why is this happening? Who's the blame? Bargaining. Just bring them back and I will do anything. Depression, I'm too sad to do anything. And acceptance, I'm at peace with what happens. Uh, so let's talk a little more detail, according to her. Denial protects you from overwhelming emotions. You just deny it. it there are reasons that people have these stages. It's not just whatever. They're doing, they're, they're, they're functioning a psychological defensive mechanism. May feel like numbness, <coughs> isolation from reality. Should not be confused with a lack of caring. And some people do, oh, I'm just like, oh, I don't care because they're just in this fog. <clears throat> Anger. Anger may be directed at the deceased. You're mad at the person that died on you. Seriously, 
particularly that they brought some of it on themselves. Maybe you have a reason to be. I told you if you didn't quit smoking, you're going to get lung cancer. I told you if you didn't do this, I told them for 50 years to do this. I mean, a little anger there? Yeah. Could be toward friends, family, or health professionals. I get the brunt of that often. Doctors, why didn't you do to save him? You know, if we would have you know, they're ticked at, ticked at me. Anger at the deceased for dying to make you feel, but if you do that, guilty. Ooh, guilt. We're going to talk about guilt and how do we process that. Take your time at this stage and understand your options. Anybody see the movie Contagion? Great. One person. See it. It's great. Right down there. It's a story of like a bird flu epidemic. The movie came out a couple years ago. And look at all the people that are in it. Yeah. Ed Damon, Lawrence Fishburne, Drew Law, Gwyneth Paltrow, Kate Winslet. Pretty. This is a serious movie about what really happens and what would really happen if we had a global pandemic of a virus. And when you see that, it's going to make you very uncomfortable. But it's also going to show you how disease travels, how society reacts to it. Well, anyways, uh, in the early scene, his wife, Matt Damon's wife, is, she's fine. She comes back from this trip from Hong Kong or wherever, and then she gets a cold flu symptoms, and you know, she has a seizure at home on the floor. They take her off to the hospital, and so he's in the hospital, so he's meeting with the doctor. He comes in, because the ambulance gets here, and he says, yeah, how's my wife? I want to see my wife. Well, the doctor comes out and says, I'm sorry, your wife didn't make it. She died. And so, what does Damon say? Uh, he goes, well, when can I talk to her? <laughs> and he says, she died. He says, well, I want to see her. I want to talk to her. Oh, Lord. What is that? Yeah. He can't handle the shock. And so, when can I see her? Okay, then he says, I'm sorry, she, she, she's, she's, she's dead. And now you can see the veins in his neck are standing up here. What do you mean she's dead? I just talked to her this morning. I just brought her in here. How the hell you can tell me she was okay here two minutes ago? You know, you're, she's dying? She's dead? What happened? Why'd she die? Where'd you let her die? Perfect example. Now, did they happen? Boom, boom, boom. Did not hang her. Perfect. I just think this is the best example I've seen of that. And it was a, they really got that one right. That's how often people would react to that. Third, bargaining can occur before or after losing a loved one. This can be when they have cancer. You know, if you do this or do that, we'll bargain and we'll, uh, you know, if this happens and that happens, then we won't die or we won't have this loss or we, whatever it is or even after losing them. Involves thinking about what could have been done differently to prevent the loss. Oh, if I only didn't take that trip to Chicago. If only I had been home and he had this chest pain. If only I had done this. If only he had done that. You see, that's a form of bargaining. Yeah, see, it's this, that. And often it's done we'll talk about later, you know, with God. Dad, if you will save him, I will... And then Unbroken, the movie, what does our hero do when he's in the boat in the raft? And he's going to die. There's a storm. God, if you save me, I'll devote my life to you. How many people have seen Unbroken? Raise your hand. It's kind of heavy duty, but I read the book. I read the book's better. We're going to talk about that, as I said, more and more. But he makes that bargain. God, you save me, and I'm, I'm going to do this for you later. So we'll see how that turned out later. Unresolved issues in this stage can lead to intense remorse or guilt. The, this stage needs to be handled. What are you bargaining about? What do you feel guilty about? <sighs> Depression. You may experience deep grief and sadness beyond what you imagine. The stage can feel like it will last forever, and there's no point in going on. This stage is natural and not something that you should snap out of. And does this necessarily need medication? No. But maybe. We'll get back to that. Acceptance. 
which she concluded was when people kind of came to peace, comes with accepting the fact that your loved one is gone forever, does not mean that you are all right with the reality. Doesn't mean I'm okay with it. Just you accept it. They are gone. They're never coming back. I'm never going to see them or hear them again. Happens a little bit at a time. As grief is a long process. Sinks in a little bit at a time. Now, it looks here like it's just a little arrow that goes down into this stage and do the next one. I like this model a little better, a little circular. Um, denial, anger, bargaining. But, another star, so wake up. And Kubler Ross herself said, she's criticized. Well, okay, we all the little stages. But later in her other book, she says, yeah, I kind of know that, but it gives us a tool to talk about this. So, what are the key points that I want to emphasize? The grief cycle, not lying, is a framework that serves as a guide to assist individuals with dealing with their emotional reactions to change your trauma. You say, oh, I think I'm in denial, I'm in, in guilt. Then it puts a name and a label on these mishmash of feelings that you're having and helps you uh, help deal with them better. We do not always experience all of the five cycle stages. Everybody doesn't go chink, 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 or do five. Maybe you'll, some people are probably, imagine you go from one to five. Some go to one to four and skip three. You don't have to do this. And others may not be experiencing them at all. Transition between the stages can be more of an ebb and flow rather than a progression. People can go back and forth. They're angry, and then they go back, and bargaining, and, and they're angry again, and they're depressed. And they can all be at the same time. It's not a clean thing. And if it's used that way, of course it should be criticized. But it's very helpful to, to deal with. People's grief and others' reactions to the others' trauma are as individual as a fingerprint. I like that. Because we're all talking about a different. We talk about grief support groups. Hospice patient example. The Nile and anger bargaining at the same time. Uh, Tony Ames, we had a, a patient in the, the past that uh, had a son that was. Uh, dying of end stage liver disease and uh, was in the hospital and I mean he was sicker than a dog. He had all the medical things for him. But his mom would take care of him and try to help him through his alcohol addiction for many, many, many years was really difficult to deal with because she was in denial. And so three days before he died, she had me, well, she called me on the clinic twice to talk to the transplant doctor to get a new liver. And had me call the Yale Clinic doctor. And I talked to him about, he's dying. He's on hospice. He's not coming to the Yale Clinic to get a liver transplant. He died in the ambulance on the way up. And then you're not going to do it anyways, because everything is falling apart. But it's entertaining. Is that denial? Anger. Nobody could get along with her. Most people couldn't. The nursing staff, she'd snap, 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 snap. Do this, why are you doing that? Do that. All this anger is bubbling up. People were afraid. One nurse said, this was the most exhausting patient I've ever taken care of in my life. Not the patient, the mother. And bargaining. Well, let's give him some more blood. And let's, let's do this. And doctor, if you don't go to this, we're going to take him to Des Moines. And he's been in Iowa City and we're bargaining. And if you do this, he's going to wake up and he's going to be fine. If you do this, you stop your drugs, your drugs are killing him. That's why he's not awake, because you're giving him the drugs. So stop, stop the pain medicine, because then he's going to wake up and be okay. So she, not the patient who's dying, she, so you, it isn't just people that go through these things. It's the other people around us go through these things. That's why it's such a useful model. The way I dealt with her, everybody was trying to deal with her on an intellectual level. And argue with her and talk about, well, this is why you can't go to Mayo Clinic and this is why this doesn't work in this one. And I looked at her and read her body language and you are really suffering. And we started talking and I put my hand out of it and I just listened to her. What a horrible life that she had with this person and what she was trying to do, and her husband and all this, to get the emotions. That's what she needed. Was not. So if you play it at the intellectual game, 
you won't go to get any place. Because that isn't where she was at. She was grieving so much inside to, to lose this boy. So, the stages are not just about. I like this one. There's no textbook grief. Or the book says you shouldn't be doing that. Death and dying, she's reading, obviously. The uh, loss. And she's painting a picture. You're not supposed to be doing that. You're supposed to be doing this. Wait a minute. I'll follow a book. To her, this may be art therapy and music therapy may be a very powerful way to deal with this. We're finding more and more kids, that's very important, because they can't express things emotionally, even if you get them to talk and open up, that they can draw. And they can put their feelings into their art. So, let's go back to Bob. So what would Bob say about Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's stages? Uh, what do you think he'd say? <laughs> Suck it up, cupcake. <laughs> I mean, wouldn't Bob? I mean, right? That's Kubler, yeah, that's grief office. Come here, suck it up. Now, uh, anybody heard of Prometheus? Myth of Prometheus. Uh, remember Greek mythology, he was, uh, he was buddies with uh, <coughs> one of the Titans, lived up in Olympus, and he saw men down here and, and kind of wanted to help us out, and so he took fire out of the Olympus' uh, kettle or whatever right there, brought it down and gave to man fire. So Zeus was really ticked off, so Zeus says, we're going to chain you to a rock I'm going to chain you to a rock and I'm going to let vultures eat you for all eternity. And so when they eat something and take part of your guts out, it'll grow back and then more they'll come back. So it's not like you're going to die. And, oh, that's pretty clever. Right? So let's see how Prometheus is doing. Take a look at Bob's philosophy. Okay, this is for the, the cynics in the room. So, first stage. Uh, he's saying, denial. This can't be happening. The vulture. It is. <laughs> Second stage. I'm angry. The vulture. Who cares? How if you're angry? Third. What's happening with you? You're in change, dude. You have no power to negotiate. I'm depressed. Get over it. And lastly, I accept my fate. Bert says, are you nuts? <laughs> so, I mean, there, there's some, you know, some the stages, you can look at these things a little different, right? So, is there a good coping philosophy for you? Does it help others? Is it true? I like this one. To experience denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance, and finally, stuff it. <laughs> so the sixth stage, this is for Thanksgiving, but you know, I don't know how the trick he's taking that, but he's over the acceptance stage. In addition to stage one, I think people utilize certain patterns or styles of coping. Five identities of grievers. So you can look at it as coping styles, too. This is just another way to look at things. Nomads have not yet resolved their grief and do not seem to understand the loss that has affected their lives. They just, they're not dealing with it. Memorialists. This identity is committed to preserving the memory of the loved one that they have lost. Sometimes you've heard people in the kids' room, they leave everything. They don't touch it for weeks, months, years. They memorialize that. Activists. This identity focuses on helping other people who are dealing with the same disease or the same issues that caused their loved one's death. Mothers against drunk driving. Said my kid got killed by a drunk driver. I don't want other kids to get killed by a drunk driver. So we're going to form a group. We're going to try to stop that up. And you see that now a lot on the more and more people are when something bad happens, they're not just Oh, get through acceptance, they follow this pattern. And they're seekers. This identity will adopt religious, 
philosophical or spiritual beliefs to create meaning in their lives. So they will retreat into their religion, and, and which we're going to talk about next time, because the religion gives them the peace that they want, or meaning. Uh, any of you see the Roosevelt series yes. on public? Raise your hands. You saw a Roosevelt series. Great. Okay. Remember <laughs> who's that? Which Roosevelt? T R. Uh, and who's that? His mother. His mother. That's his mother. This is his wife, uh, Alice. Well, remember what happened to him <laughs> on Valentine's Day. 1884, which happened to be four years to the day after his engagement. Yes, his wife to marry. Four years exactly earlier. Theodore Roosevelt's wife and mother die, only hours apart. Roosevelt was at work in New York State Legislature, attempting to get a government reform bill passed when he was summoned home by his family. He returned home to find his mother, Biddy, had succumbed to typhoid fever. On the same day, his wife, of four years, Alice Lee died of Bright's disease. That's a kidney disease. Only two days before her death, she had given birth to the couplet's daughter, Alice. So you have a baby, two days later, your wife dies, and your mom. Unbelievable. And we're going to talk about complex grief and complex losses also. The double tragedy devastated Roosevelt. He ordered those around him not to mention his wife's name. Burdened by grief, he abandoned politics, left the infant Alice with his sister, and at the end of 1884, struck off for the Dakota Territories, where he lived as a rancher and worked as a sheriff for two years. So how did T.R. deal with his grief? We don't talk about it. We're going to go in there, and I'm out of here, and I'm going to do something else. And later we know when he lost the Bull Moose Party election, if you read the book uh, River of uh, Doubt, he goes down to South America and on the Amazon. So you see his coping style, I'd say he's a nomad. Yeah. I think he's pretty, uh, he could be poster child. This is his diary. They didn't show you this on TV. He journaled every single day. That's all we know about his, all his Amazon adventures. Every day he wrote. This is what he wrote. February, Thursday, 14th. X. It gets right here. Wow. He doesn't say anything. He doesn't have to rank anything. Like, wow. He used the same process to deal with other losses. What about a Hawkeye basketball or football team this year? <laughs> Snatching defeat out of the jaws of victory. Wait a minute. Denial. I can't believe they got the touchdown. Those we were so many points ahead. Anger. Those dang Hawkeyes, you know. Bargaining. No, there was a penalty. He was being held. Look at the replay. Bargaining, you know? No, replay, that's bargaining, you know? Depression. Oh, what a crappy. Yeah, I'm really bummed out. Give me another beer. And then, you know, except as well, he's got a pissy season. That, you know, or get a new coat. But you see those emotions? I mean, when you look at it that way, it's like, ooh, I think that's kind of neat. Shoppers experience symptoms of grief after poor online shopping. <laughs> UK, London, 2013. Buying clothes online, but getting it wrong, triggers a complex series of emotions that closely resemble the grief cycle. I'm not making this up, folks. So, okay, you can say that, but... Hey, let's really check it out. Men, women, denial, anger, bargaining, and depression. Attempting to squeeze into ill-fitting clothes. <laughs> <laughs> Putting off making his decisions. Hiding the poor choices in a wardrobe. <laughs> Ted, I just didn't buy that. Bargaining, ask for opinions from family and friends. Does this look good at me? <laughs> or make a resolution. No, it doesn't. To diet or exercise more. I'll, I'll, I'll make this bargain, I'll get skinny. Depression. Uh, I like this, having the wrong body shape, whatever that means. Women, more than men think they got the wrong body shape. Uh, and acceptance. Well, return the item to the store, <laughs> sell all of the items, and give up on diet or exercise resolution. 93%. <laughs> so, I mean. Okay, the loss itself isn't recognized as grief-worthy because it's not a death. 
These are often cases of losses that are agreed, but are not necessarily a death. It's far from an exhaustive list. Dementia. <coughs> Mental illness. Infertility. Substance abuse. Loss of function. Physical function. Religious conversion. Or going away from your religion. I like this one. <laughs> well, I'm not but don't be telling me I'm not giving my, my hip and my eyesight and my, all that stuff. I love it. Society says relationship isn't important. So grief is an acknowledge. Remember back to society? And it's one that when society interprets that, no, this isn't worthy of grief. Death of an ex-spouse. Death of a co-worker, death of a pet, death of an online friend, cyber loss, thing. death of a same-sex partner, miscarriage or stillbirth, death of a stepchild, death of a foster child, other non-blood relatives, you know. These people can be more significant than our father or mother, can't they? But society, oh, that's just a step, you know, that, that, that's not a family member. And I'm going to wind down here very quickly. And... Another one, the relationship is stigmatized by society, can overlap. These are times the relationship in life is stigmatized relationship. Similar feelings of death. So death of a partner <coughs> from an extramarital affair. Death of a same-sex partner. Death of a gang member. Death of a high-risk care group. And one of you came up to me after and talked about dealing with AIDS, which we'll talk about later. AIDS. So I've had patients that uh, they're dying in hospice, and we call the family, and the, the very often the mother, we, we, we don't have anything to do with them. Yeah. They were kicked out 10 years ago because he was gay and chose that lifestyle. Yeah. Well, he's dying. So sometimes the mother comes, sometimes the mother doesn't. The father, we've had one, the father says, uh, we said your son is not I don't have a son. This is real, folks. So, a lot of people during the AIDS epidemic had, and then AIDS, what stigma did that have when you had AIDS? So if you're AIDS, you got a double stigma. So in the next class, we're going to look at the bigger picture of how each of our grief reactions are not only based on our preconditioning, but also must be placed within a societal and religious context. This may be con conscious. You say, oh yeah, yeah, I know where I believe in, but often it's unconscious. Diagnose when grieving goes awry. When is it okay and when are you getting pathologic when you need help? What's a treatment model to alleviate or ameliorate unresolved grief? From talking depression? Suggest strategy to help ourselves and others negotiate mourning. And frame loss as an opportunity for growth and get into special loss situations. So, last thing, homework? Yeah. <laughs> Find a willing partner from this class. If you saw this online, that works too. So what I'd like you to do is discuss and share your lost history timelines. So those of you that did it, remember we made a timeline of losses that we had. And if you didn't, now you can. <laughs> but this time, I would like you to choose another partner, or another person that doesn't have any spouse, and have a nice time and share your timeline with them. Tell them about this loss. Tell them about this other loss. You can flip the coin to see who goes first. And then listen to theirs. You see the method in my bag is here. You can come up with your own losses, but I'm going to, I'm going to find out that a lot of these were probably not processed well, or still are raw, or were not resolved. And when you see what other people, it will get you yourself opening up into this. If you don't do it or want to do it, that's okay. But I'm saying you'll get a lot out of it and do that. And we're going to discuss that next time. And last slide. Extra credit points. <laughs> Some of you have already seen this. And if not, because anybody over here? We're well, anyways. Uh, I hope that I had 75. I did put the website on because if you Google this, uh, Atlantic, uh, Ezekiel, Emmanuel, and why I hope that I had 75, it's not that long to read and see because we're gonna, I'm going to pick on him a little bit, but 
He doesn't seem to do too well with grief and loss. He's got a lot of anticipatory stuff, and he's not, you know, we're going to talk about anticipatory grief. I think he needs this course in that. <laughs> we'll see. Because he's, what, 58 now, right, bro? Yeah. So, anyways, that's extra credit. So, if you do that, you can talk to other people. So, you've been a great audience, and thanks for your indulgence. And next week, it'll be over. Thank you, JR. The, the time that I go through that grief series is when my computer won't work. <laughs> I'll see you all back here again next week. Thank you for coming. <laughs>